everyone. Um, I am super thrilled to be here. Um, I'm especially thrilled to be um, talking about Elixir in LA um, and to, in like such a cool venue also. This is probably the coolest venue setting that I've ever <laughs> been in. I don't know that I've ever given a talk under a disco ball. So um, thank you. Uh, first, like thank you to all the organizers. Um, I think they've organized like a really great day for us. Um, so yeah, very exciting stuff. Um, but yes, hi, I am Emma, um, as Desmond said. Um, I am based in Los Angeles. Um, I work at a startup, um, a sports tech startup uh, based in LA at Second Spectrum. It's called Second Spectrum. Um, it's uh, very close to here. It's in Little Tokyo, um, just up the street of a few blocks. Um, and so what we do at Second Spectrum is um, we do a lot of work around both capturing data and then also um, passing um, the video capture through um, machine learning and computer vision layers um, to be able to derive certain insights from that video capture. Um, we're currently the official optical tracking and analytics provider for the MBA. Um, and in addition to that, we build full stack data visualization platforms that bring our advanced analytics data to life for coaches, leagues, and media broadcasters. Um, a lot of the work that we do um, on the full stack apps team requires our um, products to you know, have like a reliable uptime, um, be able to serve a lot of users, um, and also be able to process a lot of data. Um, so we've been using Elixir and some of our products for the past couple of years, and we really come to love the language um, for a lot of reasons. Um, a few of those reasons at a high level. Um, so the language features themselves, um, the tooling that comes with Elixir, um, and the legacy that it inherits, it inherits as a descendant of Erlang. Um, and so I should pause here and say that as I was putting together this talk initially, I was prepared to just talk about these things in greater detail and kind of give you the pitch of like, why Elixir? Um, and I think, I think it's, it's important as a community that we continue to reflect on you know, why, why we love this language, what the benefits are so that we can share this with other people. And so I think that is a perfectly fine talk. Um, but as I started to think more about some of these things in greater detail, um, I, I realized that for both me and the team that I work on, um, one of the reasons why we've come to love Elixir so much um, and a common trend across some of the details of these, of these individual <laughs> details um, was that the language really reflects the realities of the world we live in um, rather than say an idealized version of it. Um, and in particular, what I mean is um, both Elixir and Erlang um, de deliberately provide a language that accepts as a fact that sometimes things will fail. And to live in a world um, like this means that we have to design systems that can account for these failures without you know, everything kind of like halting to a crash. Um, and so being able to design these kinds of systems will require a language that prioritizes this, that accepts this as fact and uh, does not sort of make us have to think about cre uh, creating systems or things that um, cannot accept failure, cannot error. Um, so one example of this that comes to mind um, that we'll go into like, unpack a little bit more, um, but we'll just kind of discuss as um, an initial example is um, the feature of immutability in Elixir. Um, and in my mind, immutability is at its core about is about having a particular philosophy on failure. Um, that is that the role of the mutation of data has in introducing, to, in introducing error. Um, so that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about this morning. Um, I kind of covered at a high level some of the things that um, I really like about Elixir, but I haven't gone into much detail about that. We will explore some of those details, but really um, what I'll be talking about this morning is taking us through this journey of what it means to embrace errors as a reality. Um, first, considering how this idea sort of sprung up with Erlang and the, the history of the language, um, and then considering the additional ways that Elixir is able to build upon this philosophy of embracing error and failure failure. Um, and then, uh, because I couldn't possibly turn up, oh, yes? Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, are these gonna, are your slides going to be available? Yeah, I can make the slides available after the talk, yeah. Um, so, um, 
Yeah, so we'll cover some of the additional features and tooling that's available in Elixir. Um, and then, because I couldn't possibly turn up an opportunity to plug Elm, which has become uh, quickly my favorite front end language, um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that I think Elm also embraces this philosophy of embracing errors um, and what we can learn from, from Elm as well. Um, and then lastly, and when I think about some of the implications of what it means more broadly to embrace errors, what we can learn from what these languages are doing um, in embracing an error-prone world um, and what we, we might be able to take away from that um, into our lives in general. All right, uh, so I'm gonna start off with this number that I imagine many people in this room have seen. Who's seen this number before? Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is the cell for Erlang, right? Um, so this is 99.9999999%. Um, it represents the um, uptime of um, uh, the flagship product, uh, the flagship Erlang product, AXD301, um, is built by Ericsson where Erlang uh, was originally developed. Um, and at the time that this was reported, I think in 2007 by Joe Armstrong, um, the one of the people as part of the team that built Erlang, um, the code base had over two million, two million lines of Erlang code, um, which is pretty impressive. And it had been in operation for uh, 20 years. So uh, let's put 9.9's reliability into the context, right? So, um, you know, typically we consider five nines to be pretty good. Uh, and that amounts to 5.2 minutes of downtime per year. Um, seven nines is considered by some to be nearly unachievable, um, but they got nine, nine nines. So this is, this is pretty stunning. Um, to kind of do the math, to sort of see how incredible that is. Um, so over 20 years, uh, 365 days and a quarter. Uh, in a year, 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds, so on and so forth. Um, that comes out to under a second of downtime over 20 years. Um, and again, like, yeah, I heard a wow. It is incredible, right? Um, with just over, a little bit over half a second of downtime over 20 years, this is like fantastic. This is like the way you sell this language, I think. Um, and I remember when someone first told me about this number, I was, A, I did not believe them. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is, this is incredible, right? Um, so uh, one, I was incredulous, I didn't believe it. Um, but then once I got over my disbelief, um, the first kind of thought that popped in my head was, um, how could this be? Like, how could a system that's been around for 20 years fail so rarely? Or how could it have so few errors? Um, and the more that I learned about Erlang, um, what I realized was that was really asking the wrong question. Um, what I realized was uh, this number isn't a reflection of a language that prevented or avoided or tried to live in a world that was absent of errors, but one that recognized errors as a matter of fact in the world that we live in. Errors are unavoidable, so how do we build systems that can accept that world? Um, I think this is really telling when you consider the title of Joe Armstrong's 2003 thesis where he describes the background of how Erlang came to be. Um, the title is Making Reliable Distributed Systems in the Presence of Software Errors. Not despite, um, not um, you know, trying to avoid them, it's in the presence of them. We just accept as fact that these errors are going to be there. Um, in the introduction to uh, the thesis, he says, um, Large systems will probably always be delivered containing a number of errors in the software. Nevertheless, such systems are expected to behave in a reasonable manner. Um, and so this really stuck out to me because a lot of times when, you, when we talk about software development, when we talk about software engineering, we talk about what can we do to make sure that our code is error free and like we just, you know, we're gonna throw tests at it and we're gonna throw type safety at it and we're just gonna make sure that like as much as we can our code is just nothing wrong ever happens. Um, and, and to realize that the genesis of this language is coming from a place where um, you know, these systems were so widely distributed, they were used by so many people, and so um, the engineers just took as fact, prima facie, that errors are going to happen. They will be introduced sometimes. And what we have to do is ensure that when those things, when some things fail, they can fail fast, and other processes can, can continue to march along. Um, so, to kind of understand a little bit more about how Erlang does this and what that entails, we have to sort of dive deep into a bit of history. Um, and we're gonna start in the 1980s, um, where at Ericsson, the computer science laboratory that Joe Armstrong was a part of, um, searched for ways to make these processes of developing software um, 
result in more reliable systems that are both easier and less expensive to build and maintain. Um, and that takes us to 1986. So um, in 1986, Joe Armstrong starts working on a language that would eventually become Erlang. Um, so the interesting thing that I learned from reading his thesis was at the time, the language started as an experiment to add concurrent processes to Prolog, and he actually wasn't even really intending to design a new programming language when he first started working on this. He was interested in working on a program called uh, the Plain Old Telephony Service. Um, and at the time, the best, best method for working on this was um, to use a variant of Prolog that um, was augmented with parallel processes. Um, which, you know, again, people who have used OTP, this should sound somewhat familiar um, or sort of uh, a hint to, to what's to come. Um, but what was interesting is that, you know, back in the day, 30 odd years ago, there were really only two models for approaching concurrency. Um, and the dominant one at the time was uh, the idea of shared state concurrency. So shared state concurrency involves this idea of mutable state where there's you know, literally memory that can be changed. Um, we can mutate it, we can move stuff around. Um, and languages like C, Java, C++, et cetera, they have this idea um, where there's this you know, stuff called memory and we can poke at it and we can change it and we can do stuff to it. Um, and this is, this is fine um, so long as you only have one process doing all the changing, right? Um, as soon as you have multiple processes sharing and modifying the same memory, this becomes very quickly a recipe for disaster. Like, um, like things go wrong really, really quickly. Um, and so the, the problem, right, is that all of a sudden when we have shared memory, you need to prevent against simultaneous uh, modification of that shared memory. Um, so once that problem is introduced, well, how do we solve that? Um, so the like common fix for that is uh, to have some kind of locking mechanism. Um, so depending on the language that you're working with, um, you may call this a mutex, a synchronized method, um, but either way, it's, it's a locking mechanism. Um, so now that you have locks, now you have this new problem. Um, and that problem emerges when programs crash in, um, in the, some kind of critical region when um, it's hold, at a time when they're holding the lock, um, and other programs don't know what to do. Um, they have been waiting, right? Um, and now all of a sudden, like, everything kind of doesn't know how to lurch forward. Um, so how do, how do developers approach fixing these problems? Um, so there, there are some ways, there are some solutions to this. Um, transaction memories is one way of approaching it. Um, but at this point, if you've been following the narrative, we've kind of like continued to inherit um, these problems because we started off with this assumption of sharing state for concurrency, right? Um, and so a different approach to avoid all of these problems altogether is to approach concurrency from the perspective of message passing. Um, and this is um, sort of the idea that they're pursuing in, uh, the early, when they're starting to think about how to build these reliable systems um, over at Ericsson. So in message passing, passing concurrency, um, we just completely get rid of the idea of, of, of shared state. Um, and as a result of that, any computation is gonna happen inside of a process, and the only way to exchange data is to be able to pass messages um, across processes um, asynchronously. So this ends up having some pretty big implications. Um, now all of a sudden, we no longer need to rely on mutable data structures. And if we don't have to rely on mutable data structures, well, now we don't need locks anymore. And if we don't need locks anymore, then we don't run into that other problem that we had where if you know, a program uh, crashes um, while something's in a lock, then other things don't know what to do. Um, and so all of a sudden, all those other problems that we were having, we don't have anymore. Um, but what do we do about parallelization, right? Because um, that was why we, we were committing to all these things in the first place. Well, that turns out to be pretty trivial um, if you just think about parallelization as um, a process of your developer breaking up the solution of this problem into a number of parallel processes that can then communicate. Um, so the kind of neat thing about this is if you kind of go to like the root level of the problem, you eliminate all the problems that you had before. You don't need to have to like pile on additional like kludgy fixes on top of one thing after another after another until you kind of get to a place where you're like, wait, why are we even here? Why are we trying to solve these problems? Um, so this is the idea of concurrency-oriented programming. Um, and 
uh, I found this blog post from 2007 from Joe Armstrong where he boldly makes the claim that objects are out and concurrency is in. Uh, and 11 years later, I don't know, I don't know that we're like really living up to that. Um, but something that stood out from um, the post where he made this claim was um, he's really pushing for this idea that the reason why we would, we might want to commit to this approach towards um, programming is because if we think about the world that we live in, um, our world is concurrent, it is parallel. Things happen all over the place um, at the same time, and how does that happen? Well, we pass messages to one another, right? Um, so let's imagine this room, right? Like, I have some private memory, you all have some private memory, and right now I have this private memory of, um, you know, all the stuff that I learned about the history of Erlang and Elixir that I want to share with you, and I'm doing it through like light waves, sound waves, um, and then you're going to take that and you're going to update your private memory in some way as well through some kind of update process. And if say like the speaker blows out and like you can't hear me anymore, like you can still do that. You can still process whatever information made it through, right? You are not going to like freak out and just like wait. <laughs> I hope you don't. I hope you don't. Um, so, um, so this, this goes back to my idea or the, the kind of argument that I started off um, with at the beginning that when we embrace errors as a consequence of being realistic about the, how the actual world works, um, instead of turning away from how reality actually is, we can incorporate these things into the design of our language and that in turn can um, create something really powerful when our languages are reflective of the worlds we actually live in um, that, can, that can give us a lot of expressive power and in the case of Erlang as we saw, a lot of like reliability as well. Um, so while we're on the topic of kind of learning from the world and incorporating that into languages, I'm going to digress for a moment and mention an anecdote that reveals um, in a different way how important it is for languages to be reflective of the world around them. Um, so does anyone recognize these symbols on the screen? Yes, I saw a hand. What is it? <laughs> Korean characters, yeah. So these are the five base consonants um, from Hangul, the Korean alphabet. Um, and Hangul was created in the 15th century. So I'm sure at this point you're like, huh, I came for an elixir talk, but now I'm looking at, we talked about Erlang and now we're looking at Korean, what happened? Um, <laughs> so let me explain a little bit more. Um, and I'm gonna give a little bit of like personal exposition also, because it'll also maybe explain why I'm really interested in both programming languages and natural languages. Um, so prior to my career as a software engineer, I'd spent about a decade um, as a formal semanticist working on natural language linguistic theory. Um, and it's also how I ended up like lo learning to love functional programming because I was doing a lot of work with the Lambda calculus and then some days that someone said to me, oh, you should check out some of these programming languages. They kind of seem to be up your alley. Um, but going back to Korean, um, over time uh, as in my career as a linguist, I had a lot of people come up to me and tell me, oh, you should check out Korean. It's really interesting. It's really easy to learn. Um, and I usually get very skeptical when people tell me things like that because usually like easeability of learning is a very subjective thing. It's, it's very dependent on you know, what language background you've had in the past, um, what you can have as a context of comparison. Um, but I recently started learning more about the history of Hangul and it turns out it's, it's quite interesting. So at the time in the 15th century, um, Korea was under Chinese rule. And so the writing system that was being used at the, at the time was the Chinese writing system. Um, so this in, it immediately posed learnability problems because if anyone here is familiar with like the Chinese writing system, like there's a lot of just like rote memorization. You, the, there are some things where like if you learn like 3,000 radicals, you've learned like 80 to 90% of the written words, but still like kind of a lot of, of, of like just rote memorization, right? Um, Simultaneously, what made this writing system hard for Koreans um, was that the, there were pretty significant language differences across uh, the way Korean and Chinese was being spoken that it didn't always make sense to have a, a Chinese writing system for Korean. Um, this led to kind of rampant illiteracy um, at the time where a lot of Koreans, especially in the lower classes, um, were just not given access to learn how to read and write. Um, so, and I, I should say I learned all of this initially from a K-drama that I'm pretty sure was just like 
pop propaganda, but I have since confirmed this on both Wikipedia and people at the Korean Cultural Center. So, um, But so what happened was um, King Sejong at the time recognized that without some kind of language for the people to, to bring the people together to create um, for the, his people like a unified sense of the Korean culture, um, they would always kind of be stuck relying on something that also wasn't serving the people. So he had his royal court of scientists um, think about how they could represent the sound shapes of Korean in a way that um, lended itself to learnability. Um, and so again, as a linguist, as a person who has been always interested in both natural language and now programming languages, this idea of centering learnability, centering certain features in your design of the language kind of really piqued my interest. So I started taking Korean last fall. And um, the end of this anecdote is that it is actually that easy to learn. In two hours, I and like 50 other of my classmates learned um, most of the characters of Hangul. Um, and here's why it's so easy to learn. So below um, each of the characters, um, the image is an image of sort of how that character was derived. It's derived from the actual articulatory features that your mouth makes when you're producing a certain sound. So that first on the far left, um, that first character that looks kind of like a box, um, that corresponds to the sound mm. Um, and the idea is that when you close your mouth, your mouth kind of forms a little box shape. And the next one, mm, um, that sort, you'll see there's a line in the picture here um, where the, it's, it's sort of showing how the tongue hits the hard palate at the top and then kind of comes back down in an, in an L looking shape. Um, and so on and so forth. So this, when I first saw this, my mind was blown because um, if anyone has taken like an introductory linguistics class, th these images shouldn't look that um, foreign to you. You, you. you learn these things in phonetics. You see the sagittal section. You learn about you know where your mouth is um, forming closures for air and things like that. And so what's been really interesting to me about learning Korean is that um, all of a sudden there's this like really easy mnemonic for learning these letters. And if you've ever like had to help someone learn the Latin alphabet, for example, um, if you've ever had to ha help someone learn English, there isn't that one-to-one -one correlation. It takes a lot of rote memorization to get here. It takes a lot longer than two hours to get someone to learn all the way from A to Z. Um, so my point for bringing this up um, is that I, a lot of times I'll hear people saying things about Erlang and Elixir um, that because there are such significant paradigm shifts away from kind of the standard way of doing things that's functional, that um, data is immutable, um, that it privileges concurrency in this way, that's a hard language to learn or adopt. And I bring this up because I think that actually when we consider things like Korean and when we consider things around how when languages create connections between the real world and the representations within the language, it actually creates a foundation of learn learnability and accessibility that allows learners to draw on their real world experiences rather than have to think about the world um, that doesn't actually align with uh, the language that, that, you're, that you're writing in. Um, and I say this as someone who started off as a functional programmer, and then um, in my first software engineering job, we were using JavaScript, and I was like mutating state all the time, and it was like totally foreign to me. I was like, wait, I don't do this in real life all the time. I'm not like creating like arrays and then pushing stuff to them. Like I'm creating, I, in the real world, I'm passing data from myself to others, and we're transforming data, and state is not this thing that we just get to kind of plug and play or poke at all willy nilly like. So my claim here is that I actually think that some of the things that people say um, about Erlang and Elixir and in general functional languages um, is not, not actually true. It, require, it does require a paradigm shift, but I think once you kind of are able to draw those connections between what's happening in the real world and how we think about what happens in the real world, um, it, it's actually a much closer representation to what we do outside of, of programming. All right, that was a digression. We'll come back to Elixir. Um, so uh, that's a sort of talking about, um, you know, continuing to build accessible features, I think is a nice segue to talking about Elixir, which continues in this tradition, tra tradition that Erlang began. Um, and as we Elixir enthusiasts know, um, there are a lot of additional features and tools that build upon this like really strong foundation that Erlang gives us, um, but makes the language a lot more accessible. Um, there's 
uh, a great talk by one of your MPEX co-organizers, Hannah, about idea scalability and why Erlang, like for all of its awesomeness, is not more widely available. And I think that's also like relevant when we ask like why we're not using Erlang now. Um, but I think there's also that idea of like what, where are people coming from, especially um, people who are doing uh, the types of development that they're doing with Elixir, and why, why didn't they find Erlang accessible? And I think Elixir really um, was able to capture the spirit of Erlang, but be able to make it more accessible to a wider audience, um, which has helped with its adoption. Um, so some of those things, and I'm gonna start off with like a pretty simple one, um, is pipes. And the reason why I'm starting off with, with the simple ones, I also wanna kind of drive this idea that um, sometimes the things that, we the, the things that we can do to make things more accessible can be really, really simple. It can be as simple as introducing something that Elixir didn't invent the notion of pipes. Like functional programmers have seen pipes in all kinds of languages, right? Um, but the reason why this is so valuable is that in Erlang, with the absence of pipes, um, with this idea of immutability, now all of a sudden, like when you're trying to do a lot of stuff to state one thing after another, um, you very quickly end up with code that uh, is a lot of copy pasta with like a couple of variables changed or um, stuff that you really have to read all the way through to follow and see what's going on. So for example, let's say this is kind of um, a little dummy example, but let's say we have some state and we wanna transform it with some functions. Um, so in Erlang, without pipes, um, this is one way you can do it, right? You can assign uh, the transformed state to another variable, then transform that, assign that to another variable, then transform that, and so on and so forth. Um, it, but in order to kind of see what's going on, you actually have to like read every line and follow everything. Um, eh, maybe that's not so bad, but uh, what can we do to improve on it? So maybe we inline it. Okay, um, now we can kind of see at least that we're transforming state, you know, three times over. Um, but n now we have like all these parens we have to keep track of and n it's not that great, right? Um, so what pipes do is pipes just make this really clear. They make it really simple. Um, and the nice thing about pipes, again, like this is not a new idea, um, but it makes it so that our code now, of, now all of a sudden can read more like prose from top to bottom and um, we're able to highlight one of the strengths of functional programming, right? That um, we can treat functions as if they are these data transformers that can combine in various ways um, to achieve some kind of result. Cool, yeah, okay, so uh, like I said, simple example, but I think um, it's like little syntactic sugar stuff like this that just kind of makes a world of difference when it comes together. So a few other things. Um, so again, none of these things alone is necessarily a new invention of elixirs, um, but I think all of these pulled together um, and then laid on top of uh, that foundation of Erlang is to me what makes Erlang really, or elixir really powerful um, and really a joy to work with. So um, additional syntax changes. So so um, things like optional prints, things like that. Um, things that, again, like individually may not seem like they make a huge impact, but put together, if you think about uh, the joy that you have writing Elixir, I think some of that is some of those syntax modifications. Um, also, uh, the power of metaprogramming. Um, the ability for, say, um, macros to allow third-party libraries to provide um, internal DSL. So anyone who's incorporated Ecto into a project knows the power of this, right? Um, in terms of tooling, um, having something like Mix that allows you to like really quickly and simply um, create um, processes that can scaffold a project, that can um, help you with dependency management, and also is extensible. Um, the formatter, this one is new to 1.6 and I was really excited about it. Um, for me, I work on a large team where we get um, team members pulled off and onto projects um, given like the pace of other work that's happening on other teams. And so being able to have a consistently formatted code base is like, a huge thing. It's again seems like such a little thing, but especially when you're building large scale products that you might end up coming back to six months later and you need to be able to sort of know what's going on without working through someone else's quirky style, having something like a formatter just built in is is really huge. Um, and then Erlang compatibility. I mean, we already mentioned some of the benefits of having that foundation of Erlang, but um, being able to call Erlang functions if something does it isn't available in Elixir means that we get to benefit from over 30 years of research on this language. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so I mentioned I was gonna give a tiny little plug for Elm. Um, so who here has um, touched Elm at all? 
Cool. Sweet. Okay, so I won't belabor the details, but for those that haven't touched it, here's my quick little plug. Um, so Elm is a functional front-end language that was inspired heavily by Haskell. Um, it first uh, appeared in 2012 by Evan Shapleke, um, and I think the sell that I give when I tell people about Elm is that it boasts virtually no runtime errors, which um, for front-end programmers, you know, this is huge, right? Um, so one of my favorite things about Elm besides that, those guarantees, um, is how much care they put into their error messaging system so that error messages can be embraced instead of being some kind of mysterious like thing that you have to like decrypt and like work through to debug your app. So um, I'm gonna go over some of the things that I think they've done really well in their error messaging, um, but a caveat, some of the specific types of error handling that you get in Elm um, is a direct consequence of its type system and the like power of type inferencing that it's capable of doing as a result of that type system. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm just gonna be focused on like really the superficial stuff and not that type stuff. If you care about that type stuff though, I will talk your ear about it afterwards during a break or something. Um, so one of the things that I think error messaging in Elm does really well is helping you find those relevant bits of code. Um, so I'm sure there are plenty of people in here who remember getting error messages like program.x colon 54, colon 96, um, and you have to decipher them, then you have to like go through your file, you have to one, find that file, two, you have to like go through, find that line, find that column, um, you end up spending all this time scanning through the code. Um, Whereas in something like Elm, um, it's, they just tell you up front, and they even take you know, specific visual cues to show you where in that line the error occurred. Um, Another thing that I think is really great about er the error messaging in Elm is you get friendly language. So I'm sure some of you can't see this in the back, sorry. So um, in this example, um, there's been a type error. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go into the type stuff, but um, the error message reads, uh, the first argument to function is over 50, has an unexpected type. Looks like a record is missing the field age. As I infer the type of your values flowing through your program, I see a conflict between these two types. Like, it's so nice to you. It's like a friend who's giving you a suggestion. Um, and I think, again, that goes a long way, because if you think about when something goes wrong, when you hit an error in your code, um, that's not a moment where you want someone to just be like, no. <laughs> right, so having something that just is like, a little bit more empathetic just helps you in that moment where you're like, I just wanna get through this, please tell me what happened. Um, and then finally, this one, this one just seems super superficial that I, once I saw it happening in Elm, I, I was like mad that it wasn't happening in other languages. Um, but just the use of color and formatting. Um, so those of us who build products for users know that layout and color matter, right? Um, so why is it that so many of our error message systems usually are just like all one color, like fire alarm red, like eh, 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 and then there's like this giant big text dump with no consideration for layout at all. Um, again, like, the, the nice thing in, in this system is you know immediately what happened where, and it's marked with um, color. It's the lines are like laid out, and the, everything's not just all squished up, so you have to like, kind of like get in there to, to see what's going on. Um, it's designed for humans to read this and, and be able to access it. Um, all right, so that was my plug for Elm. <laughs> um, and uh, as a case in point, I, and this is a bit unfair, I realize, but consider this example of an error in JavaScript, right? Like, so again, the amount of information that we have about the errors here is gonna be a little bit different because Elm's type inference system gives us a lot more power in terms of what we can pick up. And I kind of stack the deck against JavaScript's favor because this is an error message um, on like minified jQuery source. But even absent of all of these things, like. Um, the considerations around like language, color, and layout could be better taken into place here still, I think. Um, sorry, that was just my moment to cry up on JavaScript for a moment. <laughs> All right, um, so um, finishing up, um, we saw how languages that accept the reality of the world as error prone um, and that provide features and tools for developers to create fault tolerant systems are both highly reliable and also maintainable. Um, so in this last part, what I wanna consider is um, what we can learn in the other direction, what we from the real world might be able to take away from these systems. So 
I think something that becomes really clear once you've started, started using a language like Elixir um, is that it forces us into a paradigm shift in terms of how we think about programs, states, um, and also how language can shape what we perceive to be possible through what can be expressed. So for me, this was really illuminating when I started working with uh, the Lambda calculus because it was so expressive. But let's, we can look at a somewhat more concrete example. Um, so I am not going to say the name of the city, but this is the name of a city in Poland that a lot of native English speakers have a problem pronouncing. And the reason why is because we don't have this consonant cluster in English. Um, we have other consonant clusters. We have SK, school, ST, stop, but we don't have a GED. So usually what we do in English when we encounter a consonant cluster that we don't have natively is we'll do a thing called vowel parenthesis and we'll put a vowel in between the two letters. And that's what we do. We say Gdansk. Um, try saying it without the vowel in between. You will find it impossible. <laughs> um, but Polish, in fact, does have this. Um, and I'm going to play, hopefully, this plays. So this is the, pr the actual pronunciation of this, of this city. No, it's not playing. Let's try and change the sound preferences really quickly. Great. Okay. Dansk. Ooh, it's so loud, sorry. Dansk. Okay, that's it, that's it. But you see how in the, the native pronunciation, there's no vowel there, right? Um, so what I think is interesting about this example is this informs how um, the language that we use every day shapes what we think is, is possible in terms of what we can express. And I think just as natural languages do this, so too do our program programming languages. Um, so I'd like to suggest that just like learning about an, what another language makes possible phonologically might do in terms of opening our minds in terms of what can be pronounced, maybe we can learn something from these programming languages too in terms of how we can embrace error in the world. So what have we learned from languages like these? Um, We've learned that errors abound in the world that we live in, and we can't avoid them. If we avoid them, then you know, just other problems start to pile on really fast. Um, and I think this is a really important part of programming for me. This was one of the things that I found most freeing when I first started programming, the fact that like, it, failure wasn't a thing that I had to control. Failure was just a thing that I had to learn how to like, work with. Um, and yet I cite this as something that we need to be mindful of because I think despite living in an error-prone world, not everyone can abide by this rule to fail fast. Um, and I say this because I've, for the past five years, I've been working with um, educators in low-income communi communities of color across Los Angeles to teach computer science to middle school and high school students. And I found really quickly that when it came to the idea of fail fast, I didn't know what to say to these students because for a lot of these students, for a lot of students of color, for a lot of queer students, for a lot of female students, fail fast wasn't an option for them outside of my classroom, right? Fail fast was something that um, sometimes could mean like violent outcomes. Failure to appear duly submissive with law enforcement, for example, might mean death. Failure to comply with society's ideas around gender and se sexuality could also mean death. And failure to correctly respond to unwanted advances from someone who is sexually harassing them um, could also mean death. And so I think before we ask people to embrace fail fast fully, we also need to think about what we can do to make the world a better place for failure and, and, and full of errors. Um, so I'm gonna finish with this, which sadly also you can't see, but I will share the slides after this. Um, this is from John Perry Barlow's 1977, 25 Principles of Adult Behavior. And I've been seeing this image a lot this week because um, he sadly just passed. Um, and I, I knew as soon as I saw this that I wanted to um, incorporate this somehow and I wanted to talk about his legacy and honor his memory a little bit in the final moments of my talk, but I wasn't sure how. So I start, I kept looking at this image, I kept looking at this, this image, and it has like advice like, be patient no matter what. Um, don't trouble yourself with matters you cannot tr truly change. Tolerate ambiguity. And as I started reading these uh, items more and thinking about what I was talking about, I was like, oh, duh. It's just kind of, we end here, right? Because. I, I think it's very fitting that someone who has spent his lifetime working on the connections between technology and policy would also produce something like this list. Um, these principles that we can apply equally to languages that we use to create new things in the world, as well as the world that we inhabit when we bring these things to life. That's it. Thank you.